So officially welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this new session of the Indiana Lead Summer Tax Workshop Series. Today we have a fantastic topic and two great speakers uh, that uh, we will introduce now in a minute. First, we have uh, Professor Xu Yi Wei, who is a professor and Dean's Distinguished Scholar at Boston College of Law, where she teaches and writes in areas of tax law, tax policy, and economic regulation. Uh, she joined Boston College Law School faculty in 2017 after having taught at Tulane Law School from 2009 until 2017. At Tulane, she was at the in inaugural holder of the Hoffman F. Fuller Professorship in Tax Law and also received the 2014 Felix Frankfurter Distinguished Teaching Award, Tulane Law School Highest Teaching Honor. Okay, thank you, Leopoldo. So I'm Leandra Letterman. I'm the William W. Oliver Professor of Tax Law at Indiana University Maurer School of Law. And it's my pleasure to introduce the other um, of today's speakers, Diane M. Ring. And she currently serves as the Associate Dean of Faculty, Professor of Law, and the Dr. Thomas F. Carney Distinguished Scholar at Boston College Law School. She researches and writes primarily in the field of international taxation, corporate taxation, and ethical issues in tax practice. Professor Ring was a consultant for the United Nations 2014 Project on Tax-Based Protection for Developing Countries and the UN's 2013 Project on Ta Treaty Administration for Developing Countries. She was the US National Reporter for the 2012 IFA Conference on the Debt Equity Conundrum and the US National Reporter for the 2004 IFA, IFA Conference on Double Non-Taxation. She was the Assistant General Reporter for the 1995 IFA Conference on Financial Instruments, and she was also a consultant to the IFA Research Project on the impact of technological and financial innovation on the taxation of income and activities. And today, she and Professor Wee will be presenting Regulating in Pandemic, Evaluating Economic and Financial Policy Responses to the Coronavirus Crisis. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for having us. Super uh, delighted to be here today. Diane and I are going to be talking about a paper that we wrote with two of our colleagues at Boston College, um, Hiba Hapis and Natalia Schnitzer. It's called Regulating in Pandemic, and it's about um, economic and financial policy responses to the coronavirus crisis. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to split the time and I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes um, and then Diane is going to talk um, for another 10 minutes. Um, and uh, let me just pull up our slides so we can start. And Okay, and let me just close this down. Um, okay, so um, this paper, in this paper, we're basically sort of looking at um, our, our current coronavirus crisis, which as we all know is a, a big public health crisis. Um, in, in the US, it's killed over 100,000 people in the last two and a half months. Um, we have over 40,000, uh, four, uh, sorry, 40, 40 million uh, unemployment filings between mid-March and the end of May. Um, and in increasingly also the, the demographic and, and socioeconomic dimensions of the crisis um, have started to gain more attention um, as, as time goes by. For example, um, disparities in, in, in uh, terms of health risks, uh, mortality outcomes, and uh, economic and unemployment outcomes among uh, various racial and demographic groups. Um, so this paper is really sort of looking at how policymakers have kind of uh, thought about and faced three interrelated and, and conflicting sometimes uh, prior, uh, policy priorities in managing the coronavirus crisis. Um, uh, and those that we identified in the paper are um, the importance of providing social insurance and a social safety net for individuals, um, the importance of uh, managing system-wide and systemic economic and financial risk, 
and um, the importance of encouraging uh, desirable, uh, critical, uh, uh, spatial, uh, uh, behavioral um, behaviors um, that, that are, are good for public health, right? So where we're at with this paper is we're in the process of thinking about how to kind of make it a actually publishable paper and also sort of revising, reframing, and building on the current draft, um, possibly adding a new uh, draft to that. And uh, an argument that we have been sort of thinking through and would like to float by you today is this question of how, um, as the crisis goes on, how the U.S. policy approach has uh, shifted and, and the reasons for that. Um, and so how we're going to divide the talk up is that I'm going to sort of give you a uh, a, a sort of theoretical framework for, for the, the paper and then turn it over to Diane to explain um, uh, our, our, our thinking about how the U.S. has shifted from, from what one might think of as an injunction-based um, lockdown type of regime towards a, a more um, familiar uh, liability rules regime and, and private contracting approach um, as, as time has gone on. So um, in our paper that's currently on SSRN, uh, we... Well, let's see. There we go. Um, we discuss um, how uh, there, there have been sort of three big policy priorities that make the coronavirus crisis a, a unique uh, regulatory challenge for policymakers. Um, and these are the importance of providing a social safety net, um, uh, systemic and economic risk regulation, um, and then also spatial, spa spatial considerations, spatial behavioral considerations. And I'll just uh, do a quick rundown of those three um, policy priorities in turn. Um, some of these are probably more familiar to a tax audience than others. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I'll try not to take too long um, for this because we really would like to get your thoughts on, on the sort of the bulk uh, our argument of the paper. Okay, so in terms of social insurance and the social safety net, um, scholars often distinguish the two theoretically. Um, from my point of view, uh, the distinction is probably a little less clear and a little um, harder to draw than one might think, in part because when we talk about the social safety net, we're talking about uh, cushioning against financial uh, and other shocks. And when you're talking about social insurance, you're really talking about risk spreading uh, across a risk pool uh, with some sort of extraction of, of, of premiums, right? But, but actually, uh, it turns out that when you look at, at the literature, um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to draw a distinction between the two. So for example, scholars have argued that consumer bankruptcy um, can be a form of, of, of social insurance with the premium being extracted with, with um, interest payments and um, uh, other ways of extracting risk premiums. Uh, I, I myself have argued that forgiveness of tax debts can um, definitionally qualify as social insurance. Um, uh, one of the things, so, so sort of putting that distinction aside, one of the things that uh, we really sort of think about here in the current crisis is, you know, who should be providing the insurance, right? Um, and of course, we know that the unique role of uh, government is the ability to spread risk um, both nationally and intergenerational, uh, intergenerationally, which might make government a, a, a better uh, uh, locus of, of uh, social insurance provision here. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you start thinking about social insurance, you start thinking about the design mechanisms, right? And some of the familiar ones to tax scholars are this question of, um, should we deliver them directly, um, social insurance benefits directly or indirectly? So an example of direct might be, say, food stamps. Uh, indirect might be something like a tax expenditure. Um, another question that we think about uh, is, you know, should these uh, benefits be tied to work or not? So EITC, I suppose, would be an example of a benefit that, that's tied to work versus um, a, a UBI or, or other benefit that's not tied to work. Um, and then another question is, how do you deliver it? Do you, if, if you're talking about work, do you deliver it at the, at the, um, uh, at the level of employers or at the level of employees? And that is uh, another question um, that, that, that is very fraught. Uh, in, in the U.S., right? So, so again, in the U.S., you know, I think the conversation um, often sort of takes place in, 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 in um, thinking about delivery mechanisms on those kinds of metrics. And of course, you know, the key point here is that our social insurance and social safety net considerations um, implicate our, our um, spatial behaviors and also our systemic and economic risk considerations. 
Um, so moving along, um, uh, the next uh, prong that we talk about in, in, in the paper is this question of sort of systemic and system-wide risk. Um, and this sort of framing, I think, is probably more familiar to financial regulation and financial institution scholars. Um, but my sense is um, the sort of system-wide um, and systemic risk frame can be extended to our current givens as well. Um, in the 2008 financial crisis, right, systemic risk was a term uh, very much used to talk about contagion and, and domino effects, right? So not just uh, by systemic, we don't just mean the risk is big. We mean, gosh, you know, uh, a risk in one sector can 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 be contagious in another sector, and then one thing fails, leading the next thing to fail, and then you have sort of a, a system-wide crash, right? Um, now, my sense is that that sort of system-wide risk is is non-trivial in our current givens, um, with some differences, of course. Uh, one one is that we're not just talking about financial sector risk; you're really thinking about contagion. Um, and domino effects across industries, right? So, you know, just as a simple example, right? If there's um, a, a consumption collapse in the restaurant industry, right? Um, and then the restaurants fail, well, well then the, the providers of, of, of linens and, and the supply chain and all, all that stuff also starts failing. Um, and then you have questions about where exactly the, the shock will be felt and how, how broadly, right? Um, and so one of the, the keys I think to think about is once you're in the, in the uh, realm of thinking about systemic risk as opposed to say uh, fairness or, or equity concerns that I think tax scholars are more um, familiar with those kinds of frameworks. Like one, once you're thinking about sort of aggregate uh, system-wide domino effects and contagions, then you have these kind of hard uh, distributive choices, right? And here we have a bunch of lessons um, from 2008 that we can draw from. One is this sort of um, too big to fail um, uh, uh, kind of uh, analysis, right? And, and, and uh, to be clear, I think the question is, you know, which institutions, businesses, and sectors are so systemically important that their failure must be prevented in order to stop sort of domino effects in other segments of, of the economy. Um, and that analysis might actually uh, lead you to different results than say a straight up efficiency or, or an equity analysis, which is, um, uh, uh, or even a, a sort of optimal uh, analysis that's more familiar to tax policy scholars, right? And in fact, you know, um, uh, one of, one of uh, the, the longer term sort of distributional questions like the, the Wall Street versus Main Street uh, distributional questions and the, you know, why did we uh, let big bank or big financial institution X uh, fail and the other one not fail, right? And is that fair? Um, uh, those kinds of discussions, I think, reverberate um, up to the present day, right? Uh, another, uh, just quickly, another lesson uh, from 2008 or another insight from 2008 is this question of um, uh, ex post bailouts versus ex ante bankruptcy, right? So to the extent you have um, a, a bankruptcy system in place to just, you know, let businesses fail in an organized manner, um, to what extent do you supplement or, or override those systems if you're worried about a, a sort of system-wide shock, right? And then um, of interest to tax scholars too is the institutional question of how you coordinate between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury in making those kinds of uh, policy determinations and in coordination, uh, coordinating fiscal and monetary policy um, more broadly. Okay, so then quickly moving along to uh, spatio-behavioral considerations. Here, I think, you know, um, uh, the U.S. approach has been uh, very much focused at the beginning, at least, on, on sort of flattening the curve, social distancing, uh, now worries about the second wave and how to reopen in a, a coherent and orderly fashion, right? Um, here you have issues of, of, of uh, case counting and, and testing and imperfections in counting. Um, but the obvious point to make, I think, is that there's a... Uh, 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 a nexus between uh, what are desirable or undesirable spatial behaviors um, and, uh, and the other two, right? The, the systemic risk and also the, the social safety net uh, and, and design considerations, right? And, and to what extent, if you, if you sort of stimulate aggregate spending, um, in, in, which is a, sort of a your, your quote unquote normal policy, uh, does that help? And what does it help in the light of, of, of sort of our unique spatial constraints in the current crisis? So uh, one last thing I just want to talk about before turning it over to Diane is um, policy uh, constraints and considerations. And we note this in the paper a little bit. Be curious to hear your thoughts on how we can clarify things a bit better. Um, and, and that is the question of, you know, what is the environment, right, in, in, in which we are making um, uh, these sort of policy choices, right? And in some sense, you know, what, is, what are the unique things that a, a tax and regulation scholar can, 
can, can contribute to the conversation other than just a political economy or, or a politics-based analysis, right? Um, and here, you know, I think there's a, a bunch of things that in the U.S. context are, are sort of loom large, right, in, 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 as a backdrop. Um, be, beyond the sort of obvious sort of uh, uh, conflicts between the three goals and the need to balance the three goals, um, and, and beyond the thing I already talked about of, of, of sort of um, weighing systemic considerations versus sort of uh, more individual equity, uh, efficiency, and fairness considerations, um, I think we're sort of looking at a unique environment where we've made a lot, I'm just forwarding down to the last point, right, a lot of prior institutional choices that then bind us now. Right. So, for example, um, I, I, I would probably say the U.S. is not a country that has a long history of handing out toilet papers directly to people. Right. Also, probably not a country that that um, uh, has has a, a uniquely robust social insurance system. Um, you know, we've made prior institutional choices about healthcare delivery through employment and also tax system delivery. And we can see in the sort of initial round of um, uh, treasury and, and uh, legislation and regulatory responses uh, to the crisis, we can see how those sort of prior choices um, constrain our, our, our design of, of responses going forward, right? Another thing sort of going up from, from the bottom of my slide um, is this sort of lack of a central planner, right? Like we're seeing a lot of multiple actors, um, a, 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 an environment in which, you know, federal government's acting, state governments are acting, local governments are acting, but also private actors um, are, are lobbying, right? And, 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 and going about just opening or, or skirting the rules or whatever. Um, and and um, you know tr trade groups are are are, are trying to sort of um, uh, uh, jockey for for more favorable treatment in light of the economic consequences. Um, so I think those considerations are are super uh, important as well, right? Just a nod to our uh, multiple policy instruments. I think we're all familiar with our fiscal versus monetary policy toolkit, right? Do we tax? Do we borrow? Or do we just inflate our way out of um, uh, the the crisis, right? Uh, with the Fed. Um, uh, backstopping things, um, and also our, our familiar regulatory toolkit, toolkit of uh, um, um, uh, options, uh, Peruvian taxation, uh, behavioral nudges, uh, uh, I guess ca cap and trade solutions, but also more command and control solutions. And then an interesting question, which uh, Diane is going to pick up around about now, is this question about of timing, right? At, at what point do, do what kinds of regulatory tools um, take front and center? So as, as we go uh, as we were in lockdown, you know, maybe uh, uh, direct social insurance was more of a, a, a subsidiary role, right? But then as we sort of come out of lockdown, how do we negotiate the need to, to sort of uh, uh, keep facilitating uh, spatially responsible behaviors while also providing social insurance? Um, so that is uh, the framework. And uh, Diane, do you want to keep talking? I can move the slideshow for you. Okay, great. Um, so moving really right on to the phase of looking at what the U.S. policy response has been, right? As the U.S. sought to implement the three basic policy priorities that Shu Yi outlined, um, what we're looking at and what we're, we're sort of exploring as our argument here is the idea that the U.S. has really moved from what was initially an injunctive sort of lockdown approach uh, to one that's more liability and regulatory oriented and really is in a sense a return to what we're comfortable with. Uh, so first with the injunctive approach, where do we see that? Uh, clearly with the spatial limits, right? Stay at home orders, uh, border restrictions and the closure of most in-person government services. But we also see it in the first, or the two major uh, legislative responses of Congress at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Uh, the paper discusses them in detail, so I won't spend too much time on it, um, but just to highlight a few features, what we see in the, both the Family First and the CARES Act are um, a series of provisions that are really trying to make it financially plausible for workers to stay home, for businesses to pay workers who are not uh, necessarily showing up, uh, and to keep those businesses afloat while they themselves are earning no, um, uh, no revenue. So we see it with paid leave, paid sick leave, other kinds of expanded family and medical leave, relaxing unemployment requirements, in fact, expanding benefits and time coverage, um, some protections for housing, uh, and then the small business loans that can convert into grants, particularly for those small businesses that are continuing to pay workers, right? Um, and so that gives us a sense of the injunctive approach. So then we uh, start to see the shift and move our slide uh, from injunctive to liability, right? And 
the really, this raises three, excuse me, four major questions outlined here on the slide. Why do we think we see a shift from an injunctive response to the pandemic to a more liability-based approach? Where do we see it? What's your example? Uh, what difference does it make? Right? And then how stable might we think this shift is? Right? So first on to why. Uh, and we have a number of factors outlined here. I just want to highlight a few. First, the changing salience, at least in the US, of the pandemic. And again, I think I'd just like to reiterate something that was a theme or a thread running through Xu Yi's comments, right? Uh, we think a lot of the questions that we're exploring are going to be universal, but the context in which jurisdictions uh, and countries are answering them or assessing them are going to look different, right? Um, so in the US, at the outset, Right? When we had hospitals suffering from a uh, crisis in their ICUs, their intensive care units, uh, PPE was not widely available or predictably available, uh, the sense of the pandemic was um, quite salient for most, uh, most individuals in the US. Um, but as that crisis element has faded, hospitals have begun to get their um, units under control, PPE is more available. Uh, the, the crisis element has receded, um, it, at least it seems to have receded for many uh, in the US. And adding to that, we have HIPAA, the sort of health care privacy regulations that really do constrain how much information is put out there uh, regarding uh, medical care. And so we, we're not going to have visuals about those who are suffering from um, COVID-19. Uh, and in, so really, we're looking at numbers. And so salience seems to be down. But at the same time, the financial costs, the burdens of a injunctive approach, a lockdown, are the pressure from that is increasing. So that prong is rising. So if you think about the three prongs uh, Shu Yi identified, that's the prong that's really gaining pressure as we're thinking about uh, what Congress is hearing, uh, what the government is hearing. Workers who may have had some financial cushion, that, that it's gone. Uh, businesses have fixed costs, but little or no revenue. Taxes are limited. Um, and as we think about th those pressures, the reduction in the salience, and so maybe less focus on the spatial behavioral prong and an increased focus on the economic prong, uh, the shift that we're seeing in some ways might be viewed as a return to our baseline regulatory preferences, right? So if you think about the US, first of all, as Shu Yi noted, we have a federal system. So uh, we're not gonna have the kind of central planner we might in other contexts. Um, and we're gonna see lots of variation across the states in ways that are gonna be relevant to their experience in response to the pandemic. Thinking here, weather, population density, whether it's urban or rural, the types of industry, right? Um, we, as she's mentioned, uh, don't have the most expansive social safety net as a baseline. That has not been our um, preference in the US. And so uh, continuing or expanding any kind of injunctive approach is re would really require substantial continued investment in social safety net. That's not been our predilection. Uh, uh, shifting more towards opening and a liability approach uh, reduces, uh, in theory, the pressure to provide a social safety net. Um, and a couple of others, but I just want to mention two more. Uh, the much discussed culture of uh, individual freedom in the US. Uh, to what degree does that constrain our ability uh, to enforce various kinds of practices that essentially look more part of an injunctive regime? Uh, you know, does it prevent us from doing things on an actual legal level or is it a cultural restriction? But, but where does that fit in? And finally, and, and sort of related to that, if we were to continue instead with more injunctive types of approaches, even as we opened up the economy, we might still be looking at something like extensive uh, tracing and data collection in a way and at a level uh, that would not typically be well received in the US. And so uh, a shift towards a liability or regulatory approach seems more consistent with our past. All right, so that brings us to where do we see these examples? First, lifting the orders to stay at home. Happens over time, phases, but that's coming across the country. Politicians saying, and in fact, you just heard another uh, out of Florida again today, the governor, we're not doing a second shutdown. Right? Uh, we've had questions about states or businesses either changing or stopping their reporting of certain outbreaks in businesses. This has particularly been an issue in the, or been one that's public in the meatpacking industry, for example, in North Carolina and Nebraska. Uh, we also see it with changing financial incentives, right? So 
uh, as the economy opens up, if your employer opens, reopens, and you decline to go back to work, uh, typically we expect you're going to lose your unemployment benefits. It's a serious uh, risk, right? So now you're really being pushed into work. Uh, the Trump administration has just suggested uh, replacing what had been previously a $600 increase in weekly unemployment benefits, replacing that with instead a temporary cash incentive to go get a job. So rather than supporting workers who are staying home, pushing workers out into the workplace. Uh, and also the, the Trump administration's recent proposal to have a, a trillion dollar infrastructure package over 10 years uh, with the goal of stimulating the economy sends that same signal, open up, that's what the mission is. Uh, and then last, I just want to mention the use of liability waivers. We're starting to see that uh, in some businesses, other organizations, uh, as a way to say, yes, we're open, you come at your own risk. That's how we're gonna manage it. Uh, and just as quick example, the Republican National Convention that's uh, slated to be held in Florida in August is now looking at that, uh, using uh, waivers for attendees. Uh, and the Oklahoma Trump rally uh, scheduled uh, for this weekend on the website, they're uh, saying it comes with a waiver. You join us, it, there's a waiver with that. Uh, and then I just want to mention at the bottom, right, more broadly, this idea of sort of the regulatory liability regime, it's really leading it to the parties, right? Uh, you can open up and then you navigate the risk and how we're gonna conduct the opening. Uh, and so when you think about workers and employers, as I've mentioned, if your employer offers you a job, uh, opens up, you may be pressured to take it if you're not gonna have unemployment, but how successful will you be in pushing back on the employers to make sure they're maintaining uh, the required safety and health protocols? Uh, you may have rights to do that, but is it gonna work? All right, so what difference does this make? Um, four uh, bullet points up here, just to briefly highlight the things we wanna keep an eye on. So first, public health outcomes. Uh, how we, might we think those would be different as we shift from an injunctive response to the pandemic to a more liability or regulatory? First, with respect to uh, COVID infections, are we gonna actually see the increase that many would expect from an opening? Are we gonna see differences among who's getting sick? Is there going to be any kind of shift in who's at risk? With respect to non-COVID health concerns, one of the arguments has been if we open up the economy, uh, people will be able to start going back to get important but non-COVID related medical treatment uh, that they'd be suffering when they hadn't been receiving that treatment in the preceding two or three months. Does that happen? Right? What about economics? Right? As we envision a shift from an injunctive response to a liability response, what does that mean for the economy mid to long term? And one way you can think of it as a trade-off, we can imagine opening up, right, return to business, but with uh, increased, uh, you know, sort of virus presence. What, what sort of economic impact does that create versus a longer lockdown that's going to require more government support uh, to maintain both individuals and businesses who are staying out of the workplace? Uh, and so what does that look like down the line? I do want to jump in the last minute or two to the final one, socioeconomic and racial dimensions of a shift from an injunctive response to pandemic to a liability one. And really, these are just some preliminary observations in part uh, because data is not, in some cases, not being reported along these lines or it's incomplete. And this has been a focus of discussion in the US in recent weeks with some expectation that that's going to be changing, but we have to see uh, what data becomes available. Two things just to uh, highlight here, during the injunctive phase, right, when we're subsidizing workers to stay home, making it possible, what might we imagine as some of the effects here that we're looking at? First, it might enable workers who cannot perform remotely, and often, not exclusively, but often those will be low-wage service workers whose jobs cannot be performed sort of at home. Uh, but by subsidizing them, we enable them to stay home. Uh, now that, that looks like that's a positive in terms of the injunctive side, but it is important to note that even during that phase, we had many essential workers who are out there working. And there's emerging data uh, in the US on who these workers are based on income and race and whether or not they were bearing uh, disproportionate burdens of risk and negative health outcomes. Uh, in terms of during the injunctive phase, efforts to increase access to healthcare, particularly COVID-related healthcare, uh, that's a positive, but 
It cannot undo the pre-existing uh, socioeconomic disparities in health, health, health itself, and healthcare access. And so that's, a, that's a, one of those sort of underlying choices or constraints in the system uh, that impact really how far we can go now. As we shift to a liability approach and we're thinking about socioeconomic and racial issues, um, one of the questions to be thinking about, uh, what kind of pressure does that put on those who cannot work remotely? Right? Uh, and again, who, who has those jobs? What kinds of jobs? And if they have to go back to work, what's their ability to ensure that they're doing so in a safe uh, environment? And so last slide, how stable is this shift? And I really want to reiterate, we're not suggesting there's some bright line between injunctive regime and a liability response. Um, it's a spectrum. Uh, it's certainly not absolute. And at the, as I mentioned, even during the sort of height of the lockdown, the injunctive approach, uh, we had many essential workers and businesses active, right? Um, but nonetheless, there is sort of a meaningful difference as you move from a in, more injunctive approach to a more liability approach. Uh, the pendulum could certainly swing back, okay? um, and we'll close out our slides here. Um, the pendulum could swing back. The question is under what circumstances, right? Uh, and I think one of the things that we're sort of looking at, at least in the U.S. on that question, is that we would imagine it would take the healthcare crisis swamping the economic pressures uh, before we would see a significant swing back. Um, and what does that really mean? What would that healthcare swamping look like? Uh, one imagines it's going to be a situation in which key or powerful actors are experiencing um, the crisis in healthcare. So for example, if hospital ICUs uh, begin to see a return to uh, more than full beds, inability to manage um, other kinds of healthcare needs. And if that impacts those who are influential, those who are powerful, uh, we might see a return uh, call to a more injunctive approach. But again, that remains a bit speculative. Um, so uh, I will say just for Shuyi and myself, we're delighted to be here with you all today and really look forward to your comments, your observations, and your questions.